Thousands of Americans gathered in cities across America over the weekend to protest the Trump administration's immigration policies. From coast to coast, there were more than 600 families belong together rallies. And joining us now from Miami, MSNBC correspondent Mariana Atencio. And Mariana, you were there when a mother was reunited with her seven-year-old daughter yesterday. Tell us about what you saw. Mika, I was with that mother hours before as she bought clothes for her little girl and a toy. As she walked the hallways of the airport, clinging to those court documents and her 10-month-old baby boy. And then finally, that first embrace, two months in the making. This little girl had been kept in a child welfare agency in Michigan. The dad prosecuted and jailed in Atlanta. He's facing possible deportation. So a family scattered due to the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy. And right there at the airport, I asked the mother from Guatemala, Buenaventura Martin, what her message is to other families seeking refuge in this country. What is your message, Buenaventura, for so many mothers who are coming here with their children seeking a better life? I would advise you to find another country to seek refuge in. This law here is too tough. People here don't have a heart. Because a kid is a treasure that you have in life. And when they take it away, it hurts a lot because the kids are, are a blessing in your life. You saw, especially the little girl's face, Mika, when one talks about the language barrier with these families, this girl's first language is mom. It's an indigenous language out of Guatemala. So she doesn't speak any English, barely speaks any Spanish. So imagine the sense of isolation, the trauma she tells me as she made these heartbreaking calls to her mother asking when they would be reunited. They only got the, the information a couple of days ago. So again, the long-term trauma of a family that is still separated because the dad is going to be deported is something that any family can identify with. Mika? And there are so many, so many others still waiting and not knowing uh, if they will have this moment. Uh, Mariana Atencio, thank you very much for being on the show. And President Trump is criticizing Democrats who have called for abolishing immigration and customs enforcement, or ICE. Last week, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand and New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio both called for dismantling the agency. On Saturday, Senator Elizabeth Warren said ICE should be replaced. But not all Democrats are on board. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer said last week ICE does some functions that are very much needed and pushed instead for reform. President Trump weighed in, tweeting that Democrats are making a strong push to abolish ICE. One of the smartest, toughest, and most spirited law enforcement groups of men and women that I've ever seen. I have watched ICE liberate towns from the grasp of MS-13 and clean out the toughest situations. They are great. In a follow-up tweet, he wrote in part to the great and brave men and women of ICE, do not worry or lose your spirit. The radical left Dems want you out. Next, it will be all police. Zero chance it will never happen. Joining us now is the acting director of ICE and former acting general counsel of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, John Sandwig, former acting director. Yes. Um, well, I guess, first of all, give us a sense of exactly the functions ICE performs uh, for those who are asking and uh, what you think of the call by some Democrats to abolish it. Well, I think it's unfortunate and misguided. I mean, I understand the frustration when you mm -hmm. see policies like we've seen at the border where you're separating kids, when you see the interior immigration enforcement policies where we're targeting the wrong people and no longer going after the criminals. Uh, I, I can understand where all this frustration stems from, but frankly, it should be an abolished Trump uh, movement, not an abolished ICE movement. It's not ICE's fault uh, that the, policy, the administration has adopted these policies. It's, it's not. Um, and, and Jeremy Peters, what we just see these parallel. We have the political... Uh, fight over issues like ICE and trying to throw that into the middle of the conversation. And then you have the reunion that we just saw that is mm -hmm. going to be so hard fought for about 2,000 children if right. they get to this moment. Right, exactly. I mean, to, that was so jarring to hear that woman say that, that this country doesn't not, have a heart. Well, that's, but isn't that what 
Trump wants? Yes. This was supposed to be a deterrent. And, and inside the and Department so, of Homeland Security, this, despite what Kristen Nielsen said, this was meant to be a deterrent. That's exactly why this now, policy Kristen was Kristen Nielsen made. was not prepared for that briefing when she said that. The one that she took over for Sarah Sanders and That's then exactly proceeded right. to say everything that this policy was not. I mean, she said it was not sending a message. They've sent the message. And you saw that mother saying, don't come here, Americans, this country doesn't have a heart. This is not the place to come. That's what Trump wants. That's what they got. That's what Stephen Miller wants. Yeah, that, no, that's exactly right. And I think this is exactly what we were talking about earlier, how Trump plays in these culture war fights, right? He is casting the Democrats as the lawless ones. He is the law and order, very Nixonian leader that's what who, Democrats who, need to who be will careful. crack down on these Democrats who basically want to turn the country over to bands of illegal immigrant gangs. Mm -hmm. Richard. No, uh, exactly right. I was, I was curious, uh, with, with John, which is, okay, Democrats, are, or some of them, are now saying abolish ICE. Mm -hmm. Mr. Trump has jumped all over that for political reasons. Let's put the politics aside. If you had a mandate to reform ICE, if there could be a Democratic mm -hmm. piece of legislation that would say, here's what we want to keep, but here's what we need to change, what would, uh, what would ICE 2.0 look like? Well, I think ICE 2.0, first of all, I think we need to take a hard look at how we use immigration detention. Uh, we have this adopted this concept that you have to detain people to be tough at border security or tough at immigration enforcement. That is not true. Through advances in technology, like, you know, with alternatives to detention, ankle bracelets, we could, you know, reutilize those technologies to actually have effective immigration enforcement without detention. But the reality is ICE does a lot of critical work. If people don't understand that ICE is divided into two halves, one half of it is criminal special agents combating transnational crime. And when I was there, we were doing amazing cases like saving children from child exploitation. Uh, you know, large, sophisticated money laundering cases. The Chapo Guzman play case. People don't realize that ICE played a critical role in, in identifying the whereabouts of Chapo Guzman and working with Mexico. That's the kind of work that needs to be emphasized. The really is the problem is not ICE itself. ICE is filled with men and women who are really trying to do a great job and who are committed to public safety. It's how this administration has chosen to use it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you're starting to see that with ICE itself with that letter from the special agents in charge, 19 of whom have basically said, break us away in our criminal work because the way this administration is using the agency as a whole is making us less effective. Uh, Noah? Yeah, Director, you, you touched on essentially what I wanted to, the point to raise there is that essentially where this, this bureaucracy has come into uh, some controversy is when it begins, begins to perform police functions. You had noted that it's essentially and was designed to be an investigative mechanism, but in the Trump era we've seen warrantless raids in Oregon uh, and New York and on Greyhound buses and arrests um, that are not necessarily uh, legal according to Democratic senators. Um, is that necessarily an abuse of this agency or is the agency prone to abuse? Meaning that is it designed to perform a law enforcement function and there really is no way to get rid of that under its current as it's designed? Well, it's a law enforcement agency to be sure, but the, I think the, really the problem is at the end of the day, they're tasked with enforcing a set of laws that this country is divided upon. You know, we have not modernized or reform, you know, our immigration laws. We desperately need immigration reform. We have 11.5 million undocumented immigrants in this country, the overwhelming majority of whom commit no crimes, have been here for more than 12 years at this point. I think 86 percent have been here since 2006. So when you have a law enforcement agency that is now, you know, that is tasked with enforcing those laws against that population, and and when you have an administration that says, unlike the Obama administration, where we said, let's focus on the bad guys, but you have this administration saying, let's go get all these people who've been here a long time, who have U.S. citizen children, let's separate families. I think the backlash is inevitable. John Sandwig, thank you very much for being on the show this morning. And Yamisha, I want to go back to the children and ask you, what are we learning about where the remaining children are? We saw a little girl. I've been asking the question on the air for weeks now. Where are the girls? Where are the babies? The little girl was obviously traumatized and so relieved to see her mother crying. But there are so many other little girls, aren't there? Where are the children and exactly what is the plan to reunify them with their parents? And are there some hiccups in reunifying them all? We have been told repeatedly that this would happen. And days are turning into weeks. Why? Well, the main question is because the federal government can't 
I answer the the critical question of how are you going to reunify each and every family? John was just on. He said on the record that there, some of these separations might be permanent. So permanent separation happens. It happened under his watch. It happened. It, it might happen under the Trump administration watch, and that happens because adult cases might move faster t through the court system. So you might have someone like I talked to a 17 year old whose father is being held in a New Mexico facility. His dad might be deported before the 17 year old's case comes up. So as a result, the 17 year old might be staying here for years, waiting to hear whether or not he'll get asylum in the United States. So you can imagine if these, if there wasn't a good tracking system in the United States for these families, and then you deport the parent to a, to a, a foreign country, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and then you leave a four year old in the United States, that four year old might become an orphan or that four year old might become an orphan, at least in the system, and then end up in the system so long that that, that four year old ends up getting adopted. The other thing that's important is that while they say that they are, that the government says that they have a plan to reunite these 2,000 families, they there hasn't been a, a tracking system, that, at least from what I've been told, there hasn't been a tracking system that consistently will tell you where every single child is. So some people got a number, some people were photographed with their child. The agencies that are supposed to be working together, which is the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Homeland Security, they also have all these bureaucratic issues that they need to work through to make sure that their systems work together. So it could be weeks or even months before these families are back together. And for some, never. Mm -hmm. Amish, yeah. thank you. Um, and that, I, you know, truly believe will be a stain on this presidency, separating children from their families uh, in order to throw perhaps red meat to the base, perhaps not. It's cruel, and it's not who we are. And Richard, amidst all of this, there was a, an election in Mexico. There was. Um, tell us how that plays into all of this. Well, it's yet another example of anti-establishment populists uh, winning an election very vague about what he will actually do. He stands against corruption, against crime, and so forth. Tremendous, you know, vague promises. Again, what's so interesting about it, it's the umpteenth example, though, about how establishments have essentially been overwhelmed uh, ar around the world and have all sorts of implications for us. You know him. Uh, indeed. Uh, spent a lot of time with him my last visit there. And, the, and the, the question is, how successful is Mexico, whether, for example, he and Trump, two populists, can actually get along? Uh, despite some of the rhetoric coming here, whether NAFTA can be preserved or, or, or modernized. Because if Mexico succeeds on so many levels, it's good for us. If Mexico, however, descends, ironically enough, that will create once again mm -hmm. pressure on our southern border. So it is in, for many reasons, it is in our strategic interest that, that he succeed. But again, his, his plans are at a level of 36,000 feet generality. Uh, and how he's going to deal with the, the pressures of, of office, of translating the promises. Uh, but what you have is the Mexican people who are so fed up with a corrupt, failing establishment that they will turn to someone who is a true outsider, uh, who can't be pinned down. It just shows you what happens in democracies when people feel that traditional politics fail mm -hmm. and they are willing to uh, turn to an alternative. And that's what we have in Mexico. So, coming up, conservative groups break with the president on trade. Americans for Prosperity compared his tariffs to placing speed bumps in front of a Ferrari. The organization's president joins us next on Morning Joe. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.